Hello, and welcome to the Colts Cover 2 podcast, now in video form as well as audio form. Uh, I'm Joel A. Erickson. This is Nate Atkins. This is the second week of the podcast. Nate, did you remember to bring a mascot? Uh, I don't think that was my job. I'm going to dispute those oh, no, terms no, 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 of no. the agreement. I, I, I'm pretty sure that we said both both of us were supposed to bring a mascot, so that's, that's on Nate. I did bring one. Hmm. I did bring one. It's going to take a little while to get it out. Uh, I brought a kicker. Oh. <laughs> this is my son's kicker. He, uh, he's he's kind of jacked. I don't know if you can see it on the video, but he's he's got some muscles well, to him. That's what kickers he's, usually look like. He's he's a big, he's a big dude. And you just line him up like this. That's intimidating. Just line him up like this, and good. He's got than, some leg too. He's got some. He's got a strong leg. I mean, it says here, right here. You can't see it on the video, I'm sure. Just in case you can, it says 50 right here. So he's kicking from beyond 50 yards right now. Wow. Here we go again. See if we can do it it's twice. Like York. There it is. It's incredible. That's a lot better than the last field goal I watched. So I'm impressed. So. Uh, he hasn't been signed yet, though, so I don't know if he's in the kicking competition this week. That's Come on, man. I, I think that's where we're going to have to start, though, is with the kicking competition because you have – we're just going to put this like this, right there in the middle. Oh. Um, you, can, you can hide my face with the goalpost. I'm, <laughs> I'm not opposed. Um, well, we'll put, we got to put him in the middle, too, just so that people get a good look at him. Uh, let's start with the kicking – the kicking news by now they, they've waived uh, Rodrigo Blankenship they did that yesterday they also brought in seven kickers to try out ended up signing Chase McLaughlin and uh, Lucas Haversick I think I'm saying that right um, to compete on the practice squad I think we talked so much about Blankenship on the last podcast and on several other podcasts over the last year uh, that I don't know that we necessarily need to rehash that decision it felt late for them to make that move, it felt like maybe they shouldn't have brought him back last year or they should have brought in better competition for him, uh, made it harder. That's the summary. I, I think I think maybe more will start with the tryout uh, and who was signed, who wasn't signed, um, because I think there's some, there's some questions for people. I think part of it is this isn't just for field goal kicking, unlike last year. There's two jobs here. Yeah, that's the interesting thing is we talked to Bubba Ventron yesterday and just interesting to get the perspective of the coach who's trying to work through all this chaos. And he talked about how, you know, punters usually don't kick off. So they were in a lucky spot with Rigo Berto Sanchez as well as he did it. I, I don't think any of us really thought through that part of it as much as what played out last Sunday when two straight kickoffs in the fourth quarter in overtime go out of bounds. And really that should have cost the Colts the game. They just – they. And then third time was like the charm with the missed field goal. So they had a lot they had to try and correct here at a really bad time to try and do it. There's a reason why uh, the kickers available are available for the most part. And uh, so it was the fact that it took them, you know, basically almost two full days to make this decision. And then they come away with two kickers they put on the practice squad, I think tells you it's in the end, it became more about moving on from the guy they had than finding some sort of perfect solution. There's not a perfect solution out there. So I'm just curious to see how they're going to do it. If it's just a competition and one of, uh, of Haversick or, or McLaughlin ends up being the kicker, or if, if maybe both have a chance to play and one does kickoffs and one does field goals, which is taking up two roster spots, or if they keep one around with one, another one active, which is interesting to me because then one guy's kicking knowing if I miss one field goal, I may be out of a job immediately. So either way, this is not an ideal situation to be in, but they had to find some kind of fix because the track record of struggles and in, in really the, the waning confidence of, Rigo Bear, of, of uh, Rodrigo Blankenship was just so palpable that I think it was going to be a real – challenge for the regime of the Colts to roll that back with a contending team and if it bit them a second time like we said it, it could have been a mistake they couldn't come back from so moving on was kind of the only option they had at the time well and I mean the larger point is and a larger problem is they haven't had a kicking a kicker you feel comfortable with since the 2018 season and 
Vinatieri's leg was starting to go a little bit. His plant leg was starting to go a little bit even then. Uh, this this is a situation that they've botched. I mean, we've we've talked on this about how important the kicker is. You, you we've mentioned a whole bunch of times like what those kickers can do for you. I mean, the the Browns invested serious resources in a rookie kicker. He made four field goals, including a 58 yarder uh, last week. They won their game. Um, all that stuff is round. all that stuff is all that stuff is is still true it's they they put themselves in this position i think with some of the tryout guys there, there were bigger names that they didn't sign and if in kind of trying to go through why they might not have signed them um there's a couple of re- different reasons for different guys uh michael badgley i think is the obvious one for a lot of colts fans they felt like 18 to 21 last year was a pretty decent job he didn't kick very well from long but i mean the, the field goal they missed on sunday wasn't long so I think most Colts fans felt, let's bring Badgley back and just see what he can do. Badgley's biggest problem, he's only kicked off 19 times in his career. Um, and that's over several seasons. So I, I think that that probably played into it. Whether or not it should, I don't know. But, I mean, I, I, heard, I saw some people saying, I don't agree with this, but I saw some people saying that they felt like the kicks out of bounds were even worse than the missed field goal. I, I, can't, I can't get on board with that because yeah, the kick here. could have won the game. But... <laughs> Um, obviously, kickoffs were a part of it. I think that's probably the most likely reason they didn't sign Badgley. Uh, another one, Josh Lambeau from Jackson, uh, former Jacksonville kicker. If you look at Jackson, if you look at Lambeau's career Pro Football Reference page, uh, he seems like the obvious signing. You know, he's, he was very good in Jacksonville for several years. There, I think the reason might be, and I don't know this for sure. I think the hip injury that ended his time in Jacksonville may might be at play here because Lambeau's been available with a great track record for essentially two seasons now no one has signed him he was on the Steelers practice squad for a bit last year um but other than that no one has brought him in and he's you know he's he's got track record from 50 he's an you know an 87 percent career field goal kicker like he has he had three seasons of over 90 90 percent uh, makes from field goal range the resume's there something has to be missing and he went on IR with a hip injury. You wonder if he's the same Josh Lambeau that put up those stats or if he's had trouble coming back from that. I don't know. I'm just trying to come up with a reason that you wouldn't go with a guy with that kind of track record. Uh, the last one, Matthew Wright, um, is another one who I don't think really has the leg strength uh, and also is another guy who's been trying out and trying out and trying out and teams haven't signed him. Um, and the leg strength is probably the most likely reason why. But those that's the three guys that I think that people were most interested in. Brian Johnson and uh, Austin Jones felt more like dartboard throws, like Jake Verity was, which is part of the reason that the Colts ended up here in the first place. But I think those three veterans, those are, from the outside looking in, it seems like the most likely reason that one of those guys isn't on the practice squad right now. Also, when you're moving on and you're trying to correct a mistake, I mean, a key part of it is doing it differently and not just trying another version of what you tried. So I think there were three areas they needed to find some mix of better than Rodrigo Blankenship. And one of those was, I think, not taking the risk on a hip issue. I mean, that's a very underrated part of Blankenship's downfall was he had missed four field goals in six games. So he was starting to wane a little bit, but he was still career probably like an 85% kicker at the time of that Baltimore game when you know he tweaked his hip in the in the pregame and then he missed some kicks and then later he under, underwent hip surgery and th- that that drain of physical confidence when it matches with the drain of mental confidence can be hard for kickers to bounce back from so there's that risk factor with Josh Lambeau the other one you mentioned the kickoffs i mean if Blankenship clearly is not comfortable kicking off so to bring in another guy and just make it about field goals and then have to reassess that in another couple of weeks uh, would be problematic too. And then the third one you mentioned is is the leg strength, and that's you know that was Josh Lambo has a great track record. There is it's not the strongest leg in the world either. Uh, and I noticed if you're going to go out and sign a Chase McLaughlin, I think it's all about leg strength, kickoffs too, but uh, leg strength for kickoffs and for field goals. And and last year Chase McLaughlin, it was interesting. He signed with the Browns and uh, you know, he was sort of like the star of the first half of their season. He started nine of nine and he had three field goals of over 50 yards. One of them was 57. It was sort of this revelation of this long leg kicker. And then all of a sudden he got into cold weather and he missed like five of his final eight to the point where they barely used him in the last few months. They just didn't trust him as a cold weather kicker. So you spin that forward to here and 
it helps that the Colts play in a dome. They also have a coach that, uh, you know, very much is aggressive on fourth down the way the Browns did. But that's that's where it also shows you can fix a you can address some of these issues, but every kicker ends up having some issues. So they traded out some of the ones they've experienced with Rodrigo Blankenship, and they brought in a kicker in McLaughlin who struggles in cold weather, and then and then one in Haversick who just doesn't have any experience doing it, but who was considered a very good kickoff specialist in at Arizona in college. So. Um, you know where I stand on this. I always thought they should have drafted one, even even if it doesn't work. It at least created a competition and put your kicker on notice that you spent draft resources to bring somebody in. And there's a chance that he does make it. And then the upside is so high, like we saw with Evan McPherson of the Bengals. But for where they're at right now, uh, they, they had to find a way to move on. And and clearly, what seems to me to be the most important thing to them is strong leg for kickoffs and for field goals. Um. McLaughlin is kind of like the 33rd kicker at this point. Yeah. Um, he's played for eight teams, uh, three times as an injury fill-in. Um, I guess maybe four. I don't really know, remember. I don't re- really remember what his Jacksonville situation was when he kicked there. Um, but he's he was solid here for four games, uh, but then he was beaten out by Blankenship. Uh, in in 2020, and he's just kind of bounced around. He's he's always on the fringe. He's he's the 33rd NFL kicker, and there's not there's not necessarily a better option out there. I, I spent a lot of time yesterday going through uh, lists of free agents and trying to figure out who it would be. And outside of somebody like Lambo, who's got a great track record, but has missed two years after having a serious hip injury, which makes you wonder. Um, it. There's just not a lot out there. That's what happens when you don't put resources into the kicker position. And I think we, we hit on this the other day, but I'm, I want to go back to it again. Just I don't understand a team that puts so much emphasis on special teams in the coverage units, in the roster, uh, in, in really how they view themselves in terms of franchise building, not putting resources into the kicker and making more of an investment in finding a really good kicker. Um, now, some people say, well, there's only 10 in the league. Yeah, you should try to find one. Uh, you should always be trying to find one of those guys. I mean, maybe you can't find Justin Tucker, but I, I would take, you know, Harrison Bucker or well, the next level or, down or, way over what the Colts have done. Or Cade York. And uh, he, he's done it for one game. He looks like that guy, though. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm just impressed by the, the aesthetics of it. His, his helmet says Super Jock, which is kind of a weird team name, but... Yeah, he's got super jock. And as you can, you probably can't see it. Nate can see it. It looks like he's been playing a position because he's got marks. He's got scuff marks on his helmet. That's from, uh, I think that's from being uh, the the toy of a six year old boy and a four year old boy. But I he, bet he, he doesn't. Looks like he can. He looks like he can handle himself. He probably doesn't have kicks blocked either. They're too intimidated to come anywhere near him. Well, he's got a really long neck. He can see over the line. You know, he, he's he's never lost sight of the goalpost. You know, like we they put in penalties for running into kickers and punters to like protect <laughs> them, but instead I think that's to protect the defender. Like that's like just running straight into a brick wall. Yeah, you think you think the super jock is has been penalized for unnecessary roughness? Is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's there's some risk there. Um, let's well we can move on from this situation. Although it's it's going to matter. Like we there's this idea I think with some fans with some that, that it's just the kicker, but. We, we just, said just, this all offseason. It ends up mattering. It ends just up mattering the kicker was the third most important player of the Bengals last year in their Super Bowl run, I would argue. I mean, maybe you could put either Joe Mixon or, or T. Higgins ahead of him, but it was absolutely one of the top ten players. That was not some complete football team. And they won They won a game playoff game in Tennessee where Joe Burrow got sacked nine times, but it's a super low-scoring game. And he hit money kick after money kick, and he could hit them from 50. And that's what you want. You want a chance to – you want a chance to know you can get to the, uh, you know, the opponent's 35 and have a chance to win the game. And, and th- this just trickles out in other places. Like, I, I brought this up, but, I, you know, and when I was in Detroit, I covered Matt Prater as the most clutch field goal kicker of all time at that point. What that did was it, it made Matthew Stafford and the offense so comfortable knowing we don't have to get it into it, you know, to score a touchdown. People didn't have to play hero ball. You just had to do your jobs. And, and Stafford, I think it's a big reason why he has the most fourth quarter comebacks of any quarterback since he entered the league, is it created this calmness for him that has always been his MO. And and when you don't have when you have the opposite of that and you feel like you're not gonna make a field goal unless it's within thirty, 
that's when you see guys press and you see guys make mistakes. And I, I just think there's a, a, a mental aspect to it. And um, so it's, it's not going to be all fixed this year. But I think what does help them is at least the knowledge that they have a long legged kicker, that the, the physical limitations aren't there as much anymore. There's a chance at least. Um, and they'll do the best they can. Uh, the other thing is it affects, it affects play calling. Reich said that part of his third down play call decision was the worst thing that could happen was a short sack. And then it's a 40 to 42 yard kick. If you're the Ravens offensive coordinator or the Bengals offensive coordinator, do you worry about that as much? I, I don't know that you do. I, I, I don't think I would. Um, we know the Broncos uh, head coach wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe he should worry a little bit more. Sixty-four yard field goal instead of maybe, maybe not trying to get to the forty-six instead of maybe maybe move that target line up a little bit when you have he, a, when you have a minute to play. Nathaniel Haggett was like the opposite of Frank Reich. Like they had a fourth and five, three timeouts, and he's just like, we're just going to run the clock all the way down and try the most uh, low percentage field goal attempt we can possibly try, rather than put it on Russell Wilson. The hard truth is that I think I think what's going to happen with this is this is going to be an issue all season. No doubt. Uh, based on McLaughlin's history, um, I like him. I wrote a story on him and his rookie season, you, you know, but that doesn't help anybody make kicks. And he's he's a lifetime, you know, under 80% kicker. Um, maybe it catches fire for him here. He's got a lot of experience. It's not going to be weird for him to be in a game. Um, or Havers- Haversick it will be. Haversick's completely unknown, essentially, if, if, the, if he's kicking field goals. Uh, but the, the reality is that when you get in this cycle, sometimes you end up in this cycle for the entire season. And that's that's not a great thing to think, but it's where they are. Yeah, and it's this is obviously looking way ahead, but where I think about this in the end, and, and the reason kick yourself first and foremost to me is about the ceiling of a team. And this puts even more pressure on this team to get a home playoff game where they're not out in the cold and they're also not in a road environment where it's their fans who can be silent at a field goal. I mean, that's they're just going to have games that will come down to that. So if they're at home in a playoff game against the uh, Raiders or some team like that, that's a lot better than, than what they'll eventually have to do, which is go into like a Buffalo or a Baltimore or Kansas City and make kicks there. Uh, you hope, You hope that – you know, that's late enough in the process that the whole team can put together a performance where it doesn't come down to that. But it definitely puts pressure on the rest of their units. And that's kind of what stood out to me from Sunday was that you look at the end of – obviously, they were, the Colts were down 20-3, to three, so they had a lot of ground to come back. The offense was cooking. They they you know stormed back from 17 down. The defense was getting the stops. Could he pay with two sacks in overtime? And none of it ended up getting a victory because of special teams. So that can, that can put pressure on the rest of your units where the defense doesn't just need stops, they need turnovers. The offense doesn't need to just move the ball, they need to find the end zone. So that's kind of where I, I land on this, is just the pressure and the, the stress it's going to put on those other two units. And, but, but the good thing for the Colts is they have talent on those sides of the ball. They didn't show up either enough on Sunday. It's just they're going to have to win with those units and survive the kicker position. Playoff worth for three and a half quarters was pretty hard to see on Saturday. Um, yeah. It, until they un, – there's there's a couple ways to look at that game. I think, you know, if you dive into some of the numbers like EPA and DVOA, um, they end up looking better uh, than, than their result looked because of uh, the way they moved the ball. Um, Houston's offensive production was sort of confined to, honestly, the worst possible situations. Um, the defense, the defense did not do a good job of taking advantage of some of the, the of the uh, opportunities it was given. But the other way to look at this is that was the Houston Texans, and to come away with a tie, to be down twenty to three, to have some of the issues uh, creep up that we saw, um, is concerning until we see something else. I mean, we've we've seen one game that's worth something. Uh, I, in terms of talking about the preseason, I was watching the Manning cast. I like watching the Manning cast better than the regular broadcast because I feel like you learn more. And listening to Eli and Peyton talk about uh, the futility of watching preseason games um, it, to try to prepare for a, a broadcast was just a reminder of how little you can take. So we have, we have one data point so far for the 2022 Colts. And for three and a half quarters, it looked really bad. It did. Um, they, they, only, they did not make enough plays on defense big or otherwise um they were bad in the red zone again 
Uh, I think play calling has something some to do with it. I think drops have a lot more to do with it. Uh, you know, if, if Alec Pierce and Ashton Doolin make catches of balls, they should catch. It's a very different red zone performance, you know. Uh, over the, over time, though, uh, the red zone performance has gone down. That's a concern. Like, what's, what's going on in the red zone? That's an issue. Um, there's a lot to be worried about going into a Jackson, going into a place in Jacksonville that's literally the worst place in the NFL for the Colts. Yeah, no question. This team, the last eight quarters they've played, and even if you want to take it further than that to the Raiders game, it's not been very pretty outside of really half a quarter against against the Texans where they stormed back. So they definitely have some things to prove. And it, th- this week is so pivotal for that because, like you mentioned, because it is Jacksonville. And, you know, there's it's easy to get negative on this team right now. This is also an opportunity to really – restore faith here like if they can get that monkey off their back win in Jacksonville then all of a sudden the record would be 1-0 and 1 heading into a huge game against the Chiefs the feeling is just a lot different and also of course it's the way it looks and what they fix and what they what they address I think the positive for me from the uh from the Texans game which there weren't a lot of positives but to me it's the way the passing game got it together when they had to get it together that they let it come back this team was so bad in the fourth quarter a year ago and it felt like when they went down 17 they didn't have the passing game to just engineer they didn't have there were some very big third and long completions in the the last couple minutes of that game and I also think what underscored is like how complete this offense can be when they have that going because they were willing to run with Jonathan Taylor down multiple scores and they're able to do it in tempo situations and cut off 13 yard 15 yard gains stuff that other run games can't do they can't you know you can't win four yards at a time at that stage but you can win 15 yards at a time and they can move so fast because they know what they are and so I I was really encouraged with with Matt Ryan's leadership and with the way that uh, these receivers who really had a tough day for really an awful day outside of Pittman for three and a half quarters, they really got it together there at the end. Now, of course, it's a little too, too little too late, but Ashton Doolin, Paris Campbell, thought they made some big catches uh, down the stretch uh, and, and, and gave them a chance. And that's, that's what this is going to have to be, is that this, these receivers are going to have to grow up uh, with experience. By grow up, I just mean getting experience. I mean, I they obviously they approached the game fine but but part of it like I was talking to Paris Campbell and he said like by the fourth quarter you know they were starting to understand the zones they were facing Bobby Smith did a great job the Texans did a great job of disguising coverages and doing something very different which is the advantage in week one by the end of that game they had figured it out and that's what that's what this Matt Ryan iteration of the Colts is going to have to do is it's it's not always going to be a four quarter amazing passing game it's got to win when it really matters for the most part they did a lot of that on Sunday of course like he said they got to do it in the red zone too and they've got to they've got to they've got to do it early in the game too and then the two drops from from Pierce and Doolin they just can't happen so that's week one for them and um and it's it's got to get better but it should get better I mean it's short of injuries changing what they have out there it should only go up from here when the issues I think primi- primarily our rawness and lack of experience rather than lack of talent. Uh, passing game actually could be a significant it, a thing this week in Jacksonville based on what we saw last week out of Jacksonville. Carson Wentz threw for four touchdown passes. He did throw two interceptions, but he threw for four touchdown passes. The highlights I saw, they were deep down the field. They were, they were the, the Jaguars struggled with the downfield passing game. Um, and so if, if that's going to carry over this week, uh, you you're going to need receivers to win on the outside um you're going to need them to to make those plays when they have a chance uh there was a deep ball the one deep ball that they threw to Doolin I thought Doolin had a shot at it yeah he did and didn't didn't really do a good job of bringing it in um they're going to have plays like that that they're going to need to, to do um one other thing with Jacksonville I thought you know last week they were pretty good against the run after us after most people worrying about the run defense for essentially the entire preseason. They were pretty good against the run. They had some – Gus Bradley admitted this yesterday. This isn't even me talking, that, that they, they really struggled with spacing and matching uh, in those routes underneath and in the middle. That's how O.J. Howard scored his two touchdowns. Um, that's a concern. It's a significant concern going forward that that's on tape because that's where they're going to attack. The teams have one real data point to go off of so far, one real film session – 
expect the Jag I expect the Jaguars to go back at that middle of the field and see if the linebackers can match routes the way they're supposed to, if the safeties can close down on them. J Julian Blackman had kind of a rough game, um, and and the linebackers really struggled in some of those matching routes that they're supposed to do. Bradley said it wasn't even necessarily what happened after the snap. Sometimes it was just poor alignment, poor spacing, not putting themselves in a position to make a play. There's a lot that needs to get cleaned up in that area for this defense before they play Jacksonville. Yeah, it was interesting to look at the way that game played out where you know, Kenny Moore had a tough day, but the outside corners of the Colts played pretty well. I mean, Stephon Gilmore played really well, but they they didn't – it didn't amount to any impact. They didn't have any turnovers. They, and I don't think a DB had a single pass deflection in nope. that game. The reason is that there were other places to go. It was got too easy in the red zone or, or that side of the field to, to find a tight end mismatch. So it's huge for them to correct that, not just for this game, but the very next week, a guy named Travis Kelsey is coming to town. And if you have troubles carting tight ends now, just wait. But that, that underscores how much they missed Shaquille Leonard in a couple ways. Number one is – is his ability to do a lot of that, the comfort in coverage that I don't think uh, the Colts have as much without that. They played a ton of base uh, more than nickel in this game to try and stop the run, and I think that hurt them at times with their linebackers in some of those situations. And then the other thing I go back to is they kept needing a turnover. They got one with an EJ speed sack, but they usually get more than one. They should get more than one in five quarters against the Houston Texans team, and they didn't. And Shaquille Leonard's a big part of that. They, and, and not having Shaquille Leonard and not playing Isaiah Rogers at all uh, really hurts your ability to get turnovers. And that's something that I'm really watching with this group because it's been easy to take it for – Granted, here in Indy, it's shown up every year under Matt Eberflus, their top 10 in turnovers. I'm sure they, they have enough talent to get some this year, but turnovers are not a guarantee for any team. They fluctuate a lot in this league. And you, you got to give a lot of credit to the personnel and the coaches they had here to do it, to be that one team that did it consistently. But uh, I, I think Shaq and, and Isaiah Rogers are the two best at creating turnovers. When they're not on the field, that impact's kind of gone. So that hurt them against the Texans, but – um, but so that'll be a big thing to monitor as we're always monitoring is when's Shaquille Leonard back and we're about to go to practice in a little bit here so we'll find out some more about it um, we we kind of knew last week that it never felt to me like he was going to play now I wonder how they approach it the fact that they didn't win this week the fact that it's Jacksonville and things are never never easy in Jacksonville and the fact that they struggled in those areas of the game with linebackers does that play into it or is it just you know, they just play Shaq whenever he feels close to 100%. It has to be a health decision for me. If you, if they made, and they, no one said this, so I don't want to put this in the Colts thing, but if they held him back because of a feeling that they were going to beat the Texans, you just can't approach games in the NFL like that. You just can't. Um, and this team knows that as, as well as anybody. They've lost enough um, games against, usually against Jacksonville on the road, uh, to know that you can't count on anything. So I, I would... Everything they've said is about health decision. It has to be a health decision for me. Otherwise, if you're holding back anybody out of the idea that somehow it's going to be easy, that's just, it's just a mistake. You can't do that in the NFL. I, I wasn't trying to suggest they, they thought it would be easy, but what I asked Frank Reich was about how much is this a long-term decision because it is week one, which is different than how you might approach it in week 17, week 18. I think back to last year, DeForest Buckner – probably shouldn't have played against the Jaguars in week 18 last year. He looked like he could barely go through it, but they did it because they had to win to get in the playoffs. So they're obviously not there. It's week two, but you know, I just, I'm just, you're right. They can't make a decision based on anything other than health. It's just, I just think they need him out there. Uh, and really it'd be, I'd be fascinated if he is out there because the last time we were in Jacksonville, nobody was more emotional and broken up about it than Shaquille Leonard. And it really sent him into a very, interesting and difficult place this offseason where um you know he said he went through a lot of, of sort of mental health uh issues and in, in conversations with himself that that were related to that and the inability to come home from that and um there's just going to be a lot of fireworks out of Shaquille Leonard if he comes back this week and the return is in Jacksonville and they feel like their backs against the wall because they've got to get a win before they face the Chiefs uh I'm just I'd be incredibly interested to see it Left tackle, I, I don't fully understand. I didn't fully understand what's going on there. My my read on it is that 
they they think that Raymond actually has a chance to be a left tackle, and they don't really feel that way about Pryor. Otherwise, why would you give the give them the rotation? I mean, I know you want to develop Pryor, but you can develop him in practices. You know, again on the scout team, you can develop him in those ways. You don't have to develop him on Sundays when any play could be the difference between winning or losing. So they must feel like their best version of their offensive line by the end involves a Bernard Raymond who is somewhat realized his potential. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. Um, Because Frank Drake also said that the playing time would be week to week. That it wasn't that, which it wasn't that much. There's only 12 snaps out of 80 or out of 92. That sort of tells me that it could go up. And if it's going up, it's because they feel more and more comfortable with Raymond and he's, it almost feels like the left tackle competition is still ongoing a little bit as they wait to see if Raymond can develop fast enough to meet the tools he has. I think it's definitely ongoing. And the way that I interpret it, because I asked Marcus Brady about this, is they said they have a plan to work Raymond in in the second and third quarters. It could be a series. It could be two series. And he said it depends on how those series go. My interpretation of that is this this is very much a feel thing within the game is that they do want to work him in and give him a chance. If he comes in there and the offense is playing at a completely different level with that left tackle than they were, they may just not take him out for the rest of that game. Or it may be a little longer of a leash. It may be until he struggles, which rookies do. But I don't buy that it's going to be the set number of plays. You've got, 12, you know, you've got two series and you're out no matter how they go. Because if that's the plan, then then – you almost should just start that player. You know, if it's a matter of if you don't believe in either guy, then then you should just start him. But right now they feel like obviously it's a position they can't mess around that much with. They have a 37-year-old quarterback and they had too much edge pressure on Sunday and he got hit seven times and it can't go that way. They've got to play the best guy they have. At this moment, they trust Matt Pryor a little bit more, but he hasn't taken it and run with it in a way that makes him scared to put in a rookie. And they're opening the door to a possibility where Raymond could eventually be the guy who does that. It's kind of like this carrot on a stick for him. So it's going to be something to monitor every single week. And I think we're going to – the snaps he plays within a game are going to tell us a lot about the play of those two guys and whether whether they're that concerned with prior or whether Raymond's able to just take the job in the second or third quarter and and kind of run with it for that game. Ultimately, the test this week for the tackles is, I think, harder than last week. Um, I like Jonathan Greenard a lot, actually, Uh, the Texans defensive end who uh, had nine sacks last year as kind of an emerging player. Jerry Hughes had an unbelievable game, but is 34. Uh, The Jaguars have Josh Allen, who's great, Um, was very difficult for this team to to block last season. And they also have, you know, uh, the number one draft pick in Trevon Walker. There's there's some real gifts there on the edge. And so that's that's one of the things to watch for me is how do – does Braden Smith play better? Braden Smith was struggled. You know, he's going to have a, a tough matchup either way in terms of speed. Does he play better? Um, you know, he got beat with speed around the outside last week, but in training camp, he got beat with by some of the same inside moves that Quiddy Pay used to uh, get a sack there uh, in the in overtime. So, if Braden Smith plays better, I think you feel better no matter what happens at left tackle because that that was sort of unexpected for him to struggle that much. Um, but this is this is going to be a tough matchup. The the Jaguars have defensive ends who are gifted, uh, and in Allen they have one who's been productive. So I think it's I think it's a tough matchup for them. You're going to want to see them take a big step forward because again, last week Jacksonville secondary showed that they can be got if you can give the quarterback time, and the Colts are going to want to take advantage of that. They're going to have to block to do it. Yeah, I put this game for the offense almost entirely on the tackles and how they play I think that is the absolute story of what's going to go on because Josh Allen last year really messed some things up for the Colts uh Eric Fisher that's where that really started to feel like a problem was when he had to go against a, a defensive end as smooth and fast as Josh Allen and now you don't have a quarterback who's going to run from that nearly as much and yet if you're able to block Josh Allen if you're able to secure those edges I I think Matt Ryan could dice up this Jaguar secondary the same way Carson Wentz did because he has some similar pieces uh, in terms of he's got a number one wide receiver like like Carson had with McLaurin. He's got that. I mean, Michael Pittman looks pretty unguardable right now. But more than that, the 
the commanders had a lot of success throwing to their running backs and schemed up stuff to uh, Curtis Samuel in the in the game script. Um, Antonio Gibson had like seven catches. That's where this could be a big Naheem Hines game. This could be a game where Jonathan Taylor has more success than he did on Sunday when the Texans were sniffing out his pass plays. You've got to have a chance to run those plays, and you've got to put the stress on the Jaguars to cover these guys. So that means blocking those defensive ends. It's a challenge for Braden Smith, who's got to play better than he did on Sunday and at the end of last season when there was COVID issues going on. But at some point, he's got to play like he's played before that. And then Matt Pryor, if he's going to be the left tackle, you know, he is a big, hulking, 343-pound guy who his big challenge is does he move fast enough in space? Can he win against speed and you know that's been a it's been up and down in that way and in what I think is coming to the forefront for me a little bit is that they miss the Colts miss Jack Doyle because that would help out a guy like that I mean not only his ability as a blocker his but his instincts his his situational awareness of when you really need to chip how long you need to stay in and and help that tackle and the problem is not that I don't think Mo Ali Cox is capable of that. The problem is if you have Mo Ali Cox doing that, what tight end is doing something in the middle of the field for this team right now? And that's the concepts that, that Matt Ryan is most comfortable with is middle of the field plays. And it's going to be hard because one of the best uh, one of the best Jaguars defensive players is is playing in the nickel, um, Darius Williams. They just signed him this offseason from the Rams. So uh, it just puts a lot of pressure on those tackles that they have to play well. And if they can hold up, one-on-one, -on -one, then this offense could have a big, big game. And if they can't, uh, it could be trouble on an old quarterback like Matt Ryan. The line of scrimmage is going to be important on the other side too. And I think part of it is it's not Laramie Tunsil. They don't have to worry about Laramie Tunsil uh, this week. It's going to be a better matchup for Ngakwe. They need Ngakwe in the backfield more because Ngakwe has the speed to run down Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence can move. He's very, very athletic in the pocket. And I would expect the Jaguars to do a lot of the stuff that the Texans did with play action. Um, Quiddy Pay said that you know part of the reason the pass rush had trouble was they did some stuff to make it look like. And they, they did struggle with play action. They didn't do great early on in the game pass rush-wise when it was just a straight drop back either. But Lawrence is something added on top of that with his mobility. And that's where a player like Ngakwe, that pursuit player, um, is is going to be important i mean he's important just as the spearhead of the pass rush anyway uh but they need chase players this week uh, we saw last year when the when the colts played the jaguars that, that lawrence was a problem getting out and rolling out and scrambling and all that kind of thing uh it's gonna be a big problem again this week they didn't really do a great job of it last week i think Ngakwe is important for this game uh the tunsil matchup is gone you would have liked to see him win more against him but the Tunsil matchup is gone. He has to show up over and over again in this game. It's a huge game for Yannick Ngakwe because he didn't show up in the ways we thought he would against the Texans. And, yes, it was a tough matchup. But, again, another guy that that you were – stars are supposed to win you games, and he, he wasn't doing that. The you know it, it didn't happen in the first game. But second game here with this team, he's going back to the place he played at. Like he's he's kind of like he can be the antidote to the struggles in Jacksonville. It's kind of a neat story to watch is him going back to a place that he's got a lot of emotions about and, and that didn't end very well for him. And this this place that has tortured this Colts team and they can't win there. Well, he, he lives there in the offseason in Florida right by there. So um, big game for him and especially because last year – that's that was a huge part of why that game unraveled is that Trevor Lawrence was cooking and they couldn't throw him out of it for anything. DeForest Buckner was barely playing. They had no other edge pressure, and it just was pitch and catch for uh, Trevor Lawrence with Marvin Jones, who really took advantage of Kenny Moore. The second time that Marvin Jones has done that to Kenny Moore, he did that when he was on the Lions. Marvin's just such a savvy and physical player. It's a bad matchup for Kenny Moore. So it's it's about getting pressure on him to take that away because the other guy that – Really had a big game for the Jaguars was Christian Kirk, who's you know been the butt of a lot of jokes because his contract was so bad. But he is a good player, and that like he had 117 yards against the Commanders, and that's just another weapon that Trevor didn't have last year when when he had such a tough rookie season. They have enough weapons right now if you're going to let him dictate and, and stay clean and stay comfortable. Uh, so huge game for for Yannick Ngakwe that's going to spill over into what has to be a big game for Kenny Moore because it's been about three bad, three really bad games for Kenny Moore, dating back to last year's Raiders game, Jaguars game against the Texans. 
uh, he he's just a guy that he he needs to have a bounce back performance. It's and this isn't a matchup that's favored well for him. But if you're able to give him some pass rush and rush a few of the throws, that's when we've seen Kenny Moore be at his best and jump on routes and, and force turnovers and all of that. So. That pass rush has to come together more than it did uh, last week and certainly more than it did last time they were in Jacksonville. And Gakwe lives in the Jacksonville area? He lives in Florida. Um, I'm, I think it's more South Florida. But he, oh, okay. I was going to say. I was going to question, make question his uh, living decisions. Oh. This is, this is, my, least, this is my least favorite uh, NFL city. Um, apologies to anyone who is watching the podcast who lives in Jacksonville, but this is my least favorite trip. <laughs> Uh, I will say this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let this. you do that with Jaguars Twitter. I'm staying will, out of it. I will say this. I do like the area down by like Sawgrass and Jacksonville Beach. Some of those kind of places. That's that's pretty good. But Jacksonville proper, <sighs> it's not the most fun road trip for sure. Um, I don't think. No, Let's just put it this way. I understand why the Colts hate going there. <laughs> <laughs> the Colts ain't going to Jacksonville, and so does Joel. Yes. So it's true. That makes sense. hundred percent true. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think Ngagwe lives somewhere else in Florida, but the point is he considers okay. Florida his home state. Like he keeps he trained there. You know, during OTAs he wasn't here, and it's because he was training five days a week there, doing what he calls James Harrison workouts, and it's specifically in Florida to be in the heat and be in the environment that he came into the league with. So this very much takes him back to the dreams he had in Jacksonville and the way these didn't materialize and. It's dreams he's chasing now, and I'm just – Ngakwe is super interesting this season because of what they need him to do, but also what he's trying to do, which is land with a team and be a cornerstone player. He's done so much off the field that we've documented, but at some point it's got to come together on the field. And I think if he's able to be the reason that they end the streak in Jacksonville and get this season going the way it should heading into Kansas City – that's a big statement for a guy who wants a long-term deal and who might be the next one to have that conversation now that they have the Quentin Nelson deal done. So just something to monitor. I consider Jacksonville to be South Georgia. I don't really care about the state line. It's more about like a feel thing. Jacksonville is like South Georgia to me. There's Florida is like a whole bunch of different states in one. There's the Panhandle Florida. There's South Florida. Tampa's kind of its own weird thing. I've never really been to Orlando. Someone would have to tell me if Orlando is anything but Disney. Um, you've got a <laughs> Clark, w- Clark Wade who handles the video is shaking his head. He's like, it's just Disney. And then Jacksonville is South Georgia. So, um, and Miami's, apologies. Miami's its own world. Apolo- well, that's South Florida. That's, you know, South Florida, Miami, Fort, Fort Lauderdale, all that kind of stuff. It's all its own feel. Um, Jacksonville is South Georgia. So um, there you go, Florida. I just gave you a pass. I also Give wonder. Pass. I pushed Jacksonville up to Georgia. It's Georgia's fault. When we were there last January, it was like in the 70s, and that's in January. I'm very curious to see oh, what gonna the temperature hot. is going to yeah. be. It's going to be hot. That's likely humid. Luckily, it's week two. You'd think they're shapes together, but I don't know. They didn't, they didn't practice in a whole lot of humidity up here. Humidity's different. You know? It is. Um, I mean, it could be worse. You could be in – like they could have opened the roof in Houston. And, and that's one where – they only really played five defensive linemen this week, and they said that yeah, that's they got to play the plan. More. They got to play a lot more. So. They got to play more in a regular game in perfect sixty degree weather. Yeah, like they, they can't ask those guys to play as many snaps as they did. Um, some of those younger guys are going to have to step up and, and play more and give them a reason to put them in the game. Essentially, that's what Bradley said: is they they need to see a reason from them to go in the game. That's it's not going to work for Buckner. I I for Buckner or any of those guys. I think that maybe. Um, Buckner had a couple of good rushes where he had pressure. I thought he probably got screwed out of a quarterback hit or two um, by whoever's doing the official stats down there. But that's really hard to play that many snaps when you're getting the attention he gets uh, at that size. It's it's tough. They, you don't ask defensive linemen to do that. Uh, they they got to start rotating more, especially this week, but any week, honestly. When they're back here against the Chiefs, you want you want to have those guys chase Mahomes on every snap and never give him a break? It's not going to work. It's just not going to work. And Gus Bradley said that yesterday. Gus Bradley knows that. Um, I I thought Gus Bradley after the game was was interesting because he was pretty critical of his team. Yeah, we hadn't seen that yet. In coming out, you mentioned that with the linebackers not being having their alignment. With they need to see more defensive. 
uh, linemen who've earned spots in practice, and he kind of made a reference to that with Isaiah Rogers. He needs to see more out of Isaiah Rogers, get him on the field who had zero snaps. That was kind of the most surprising thing to me is how few guys they played on Sunday, the defensive line, but also the uh, yeah, cornerback and the, the fact that they played base almost 100% of the, or not 100% of the time, but ma- wide majority of the time. I think there were 32 snaps for Brandon Faison and zero for Isaiah Rogers. So more guys got to get in there. They got to switch it up and, and, and create different situations for Trevor Lawrence. And if they're going to chase him around in that heat, uh, with just a five-man, five-guy rotation on defensive line, it's not going to work. Also, those linebackers who are not the fastest players on the field relative to corners, that could be a challenge. So they need a better defensive plan for this week. We are getting close to the time when we have to go out to practice. Do, do you want to try with the super jock? I don't think I know how to do it. You just push his head down. All right. You just push his head down. You got to line him up, though. I'm not lining him up. I'm not going to give you that kind of help. All right. For for podcast listeners, it's basically a, a, a action figure standing up with a foot that moves. I gotta check and see if Nate's actually gonna make this. I think he made, I it. made it. I think he made it. That was a strong follow through, not a lazy follow through. Yeah, so. yeah, you know, that's the thing. That's the the key here is with the super jock is you you gotta hit with some power here. Uh, and as the uh, as we get done with the podcast here. We're going to let the Super Jock leave you out for the Colts Cover 2 podcast. This has been Nate Atkins and Joel A. Erickson.